And now, here's your host of Shaping Success, Wes Tankersley. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Shaping Success. I'm your host, Wes Tankersley. If you could do me a favor, please like, share, and review. Help me grow the podcast. Help it get out there. We are almost at 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. Things are moving along quite well, but I cannot get there without your help. If you'd like to support the show, please join the Patreon. For as little as $4 a month, you can help me to upgrade the podcast, make sound, video, and all those things better for you. If you would like to catch one of our sponsors, Warriors Collection Brand, go check out his coffee. Use hashtag SWC to get a 15% discount. He's up the discount for us because it is great coffee. I drink it every single morning, and I would love to have you support a great veteran-owned company as well. Today, our guest is Jennifer Boxterman. She's a registered dietitian and sports nutritionist. She's also an lifted coach that um, I have been introduced to by Mark England, who has been on the show a couple times, as well as a couple other coaches. Great interviews. I enjoy talking about success and how you generate that. She's got a great story. She also is, uh, talks about she's a dietitian. So we might talk a little bit about my uh, dietary habits and some of the things that I've been through and what I'm currently doing and kind of get her take on those things because there are so many different things that go into nutrition. And it's very important that you know you find the right thing that works for you. So here we go. Jennifer, welcome to the show and thanks for hanging out with us. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, one of those things where I, I've kind of got into, we talked briefly about my history and most of my listeners know, you know me and who I am and, and kind of some of the things that I've done. And um, as a kinesiology student, you know, that diet and, and sports nutrition is very important as well as the talk, you know, like we, the, the thing about being an enlifted coach and the coaching, the things that you do is like kind of how I like to say words are weapons and they can be okay. a good weapon or they can be a bad weapon. So that relates to everything in life. Oh my gosh. Does it ever. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit, there's a couple more things I don't want to I know there's a lot of things that you've done. I'm looking at this list of um, things you do. Like we said, registered dietitian, sports nutritionist, um, working with athletes, hockey players. Now, you're are you in Canada? I am in Canada. Okay. Yes. All right. Where in Canada are you located? We're in London, Ontario. Okay. Very nice. Yeah, it's a little bit south of Toronto. So, what do you do? for, you know, there's a whole laundry list up here, but what is kind of like your specialty? What are the things that you do on a day-to-day basis? Yeah. And so right now I'm actually juggling being the CEO of two different similar, but divergent nutrition companies. So my baby, my first company is Nutrition RX. And this I started in 2010. And basically it is myself and a team of dietitians where we do a lot of wellness coaching, obviously a really positive relationship with food, We get into weight loss if that's appropriate for certain clients. We do some high-level sports nutrition. So I got to work with some NHL hockey players and Olympic athletes for Canada. But uh, a big, big part of what we do is just eating disorder recovery and helping people find their way back to just a happy, healthy relationship with food. So whenever I go on podcasts or YouTube and talk about nutrition, like you said about yourself, there's many right ways to eat well. And it's a matter of finding what works for you, your body, your stage of life. And so our job is to guide people into their right fit. And then the other half of my brain, um, I used to be a university foods and nutrition prof. So I've always been used to split shifting my time. And I left academia to then basically create my own nutrition certification company because I never want to complain. I never want to be a part of a problem. And the problem I was noticing in our fitness culture was a lot of the kind of toxic dieting messages. So we would receive clients that were like, my trainer said I'm not allowed to eat this or I'm only capped at this many calories or carbs. And then their performance was tanking or they were getting really injured. So I didn't want to be frustrated with the trainer. You only can do as well as what you know how to do. And I thought, why not actually build a certification program for health coaches, personal trainers, nutrition coaches. It's completely accredited and certified, and it's all habit-based behavior change with a really big mindset coaching component to nutrition. So the other half of my time is I mentor and work with coaches all over the world for them to be better nutrition coaches for their clients. So I feel like my impact and the ripple effect is just so much bigger now. 
Yeah. And, you know, nutrition is something that is very interesting to me. Like I've, you hear so many different things. There's so many different diets. There's so many different reasons to be eating. There's so, I mean, there's all these things that are just so crazy. And when you sit back and you look at the very large picture of this situation, there are so many factors that I feel like can change the way that you look, change the way that you eat, can affect every single person in a different way because we are not all the same. And I think that that is kind of the big thing that we yeah. use this. I think, I don't know if they use it in Canada, but in the, in the U.S. they use the BMI. The BMI is the gold standard, right? And I'm sitting there going, I, I think about it, knowing what I know in kinesiology, which is very little, mm -hmm. but you know, you do your own research and you know those types of things. A BMI is based on like your height and your weights. It's like cubic, whatever, it's, your cubic inches yeah. or whatever it is in your body. This is how much overweight or unhealthy you, or healthy you are. And so I am a six foot three. Uh, I probably weigh about 265 pounds right now, but I, it, I'm obese. Like, I mean, and but, just, you're not. but I'm not, but that's the problem though. Like you go into your doctor and they're like, they give you this sheet that says you're obese. And you're like, okay, so right, how right. did you just determine that I'm obese by this calculation? I mean, right. if you don't know what my body fat is. You don't know what my body composition is. You don't know all these things about me, but you've just called me obese and we're, and we're getting tagged with that. And that's I right. just, it drives me crazy. Do they use that in what? Canada? And what are your thoughts on that? Huh, not as much, I don't believe, but all I can, I always think about like, what's my little circle of influence or my sphere of control? And so one of the really wonderful things we're blessed to have at our clinic is we have the gold standard, which is a bod pod machine. Yes. So this is what's used in research. We can get dialed in to the point of a pound, someone's muscle mass, body fat percent, metabolic rate. For so many of the professional athletes I work with, I remember working with a um, Olympic Team Canada rower and her coach basically called her fat for her weight and her height. And I was like, Absolutely not. Like yeah. we are going to come at this coach with evidence and we did a bod pod and she was very much in the healthy range. We continue to work together, you know, for six months, really dialed in her nutrition, made sure she was fueling for her performance. She even got leaner eating more food under my guidance because of how active she was. And I was like, we're going to go take these evidence-based results back to your coach. That shut him up. And I was like, Please do not label your really competitive female athlete as fat or overweight because he was using the BMI. And so explain you know, what that, the bod uh, pod is a little bit. I don't know that most people understand okay. how it works, but it, it basically measures your uh, body fat, right? So tell them, tell yes. people how it works because I know how it works, so it, but most people probably don't get that. Totally fair. So it looks actually like a spaceship, like you're sitting in this pod that's going to blast off to the moon. Um, what it is, is it's comparable to a DEXA machine, but with some advantages. So a bod pod is the sealed chamber that you sit inside. It uses air displacement to have a real physical determination of how much volume your body uses up. So if I can give you a quick visual, think about when you sit into a bathtub and the water level rises, that's your volume displacement. So the bod pod can do that, but you just don't have to plunk yourself in water. It can do that with air. And then knowing how much physical volume you take up to what you weigh, it can do a calculation off of those two metrics and be able to get very precise with your amount of muscularity and your body fat. And then knowing your muscularity, it can then do a calculation to give you what's called your RMR or your resting metabolic rate. So mm -hmm. it's been great because I've had clients sort of build muscle. And even though this, like I had one lady who, who was, came out grinning the other day and she's like, I don't know, like I'm only down a few pounds, but my clothes are fitting a lot better. And I was like, don't go by your scale, like yeah. four pounds. Don't worry about that. And she's like, oh my gosh, like I have lost 10 pounds of body fat and I've gained six pounds of muscle. So, okay. I understand why the scale is only showing me a four pound weight loss. And she's like, oh my gosh, my metabolism's up like 187 calories from when I started with you. So I was like, just throw your scale, throw the VMI in the garbage. This is going to give you a really precise idea. And then for me, I really like it as an aging tool because what I do for myself and a lot of my long-term clients is we just do it twice a year. We don't get anal. We don't get really you know, in our heads about it. But I like to do a winter check. What's my muscle mass, my body fat, my metabolism? What's my summer numbers? Same idea. And then I've been tracking and trending this since I've been about 24. So it's been really cool to see that preservation of muscle 
And that's my goal is to be like a 75 year old and see how much of that original muscle I can maintain as I get older. Yeah, because age is one of the things that really will destroy yeah. that after a while. But there's a couple but is different it ways. Age or is it inactivity? Because Very. a lot of the research would show yes, there's a slight decline, but it's mostly due to physical inactivity where we see that large amount of muscle mass as we get older. This is really like right up my alley. I feel like I'm kind of nerding out right now because I'm thinking about <laughs> like the osteoclast and osteoblast. Is as you're running, you're building more bone because it has your body. Yeah, because everyone's body is so freaking different and. It's just an interesting thing that your your bones regenerate, your you know, you change sure. muscle mass. People you know, I think I think it's easy to say that muscle weighs more than fat, but I also think you don't you have to have an understanding of what that means as well. Because you can right. be four hundred pounds and be obese and say muscle weighs more than fat, but the reality is is that's a little bit different yeah. than, you know, um that's healthy versus then a, unhealthy. A, a dense muscular, heavy weight on the scale individual who's just really muscular. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I love it because one of the things I always say, we have three words that are framed on the wall by our bod pod. And our three words are be curious, be kind, be honest. And when we debrief people on what their results mean, I often explain it a lot like blood work. So if you were feeling tired and you went to your family doctor to get your iron levels checked, and maybe your results did come back and show an iron deficiency, what we don't want to do is go, oh my God, the inner bully, I am the worst person ever. You just go, huh, okay, honesty. Looks like I have iron deficiency. There's information right. to guide my decision making. So do I need to eat more iron-rich foods? Do I need iron supplementation? Is there maybe an internal bleed or an ulcer I'm unaware of that maybe requires a bit more investigation and there's some internal blood loss? So we just have data and a starting point to guide our decision making and then our actions. And then we just want to circle back and retest to see our hypothesis of, did those actions move me in the direction I wanted to go? And so I find that by getting people to really focus in on, just be curious, like this is just a data point in time. It's not a judgment about you're a good or bad human. Be kind to yourself. We know shame and judgment doesn't actually inspire positive behavior change. In fact, it creates almost like an amygdala hijack where people's brains go offline and it doesn't, they don't work towards their best right. long-term healthy interests. Um, but we need that honesty of like, we can't say we're 400 pounds and muscle weighs more than bone. Right. We want to just have an honest assessment of what's our body fat, what's our metabolism, what's our body doing today. And that's what's, you know, I, I think it's great that you use the bod pod. There's a couple of different ones. You talked about the water displacement, which is hydrostatic weighing. Um, they also can do a pinch test. Like all these things have these different types of ways of figuring that out. But when you go into a doctor's office and they go, hey, your BMI is 50, they have no data other than they took your height and your weight and they plugged it in and figured out what it was, which, right. again, like you said, the body composition could be completely different for each and every individual. So I love that you do it that way. Um, and I think that that's just a great measure. I wish that these doctor's offices would have these things sitting in their office before they tell someone because I've... I've been through it. I've weighed 350 pounds before. I'm down right. to 260. I was, I'm at, I weigh as much as I did in high school right now, but I have been as high as that. And I've gone through a bunch of different, bunch of different things. I've had gastric sleeve surgery. Um, I've been through, I've lost the weight on my own through exercise and very restrictive dieting. I mean, there's so many different things, but it is a, it's a fight. It's a struggle for a lot of people. And I've struggled with, mm -hmm. with it my whole life. And the prescription that, you know, I, I call it a prescription because that's what we have to do. We have to prescribe. It's not like we're having to take medicine, but we have to have the that's right what? diet. We have to have the right exercise. These are all things that change the way that we react to the situation. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, if I can, I'm going to jump in and, and give a little bit of a visual for, for the audience that's listening. And I think you'll see points of your own trajectory where you probably brought in some of these layers. So I will definitely use my words for those that are listening, but I've got, I came with props. I have some pictures Very to come nice. along with today. <laughs> so what I'm holding up is something that we like to call the iceberg of success. And it started off by me scribbling this down on a post-it note for a couple of clients that I was supporting through weight loss. And what was happening or what I was noticing in my vantage point as a dietitian is people were getting stuck in what I call the top two layers, which is the diet culture, 
um, hamster wheel. So the diet culture just basically tries to throw information at you. Try keto, try vegan, try paleo, try this, try intermittent fasting, get your protein up to this many gram- grams. So it's like information-based. And then what they ask you to do is apply disciplined willpower. And if you follow the rules, you should get rewarded. But that's an incomplete picture of how weight loss or health actually works. So what I was noticing with this iceberg is that I would have clients come in hamster wheeling around willpower knowledge, willpower knowledge, willpower knowledge. And then they would inevitably have busy real lives with kids and moves and stress and all of the above. And the willpower would run out or there was a finite amount of it. And then by the end of the day, they were into the ice cream, the chips, the cookies, Mm -hmm. and then they would beat themselves up. And then they would promise themselves they would get back on track maybe after the weekend, after the vacation, after the move. And again, the cycle would continue. So I started to draw what I call the three deep layers below the surface of the water. So if the very tip of the iceberg is willpower, our second layer is knowledge. And then below the iceberg becomes the habit layer, the environment layer, and the mindset layer. And actually what I do is I coach bottom up. So mindset is the most important layer. And I'm going to give some examples in a moment, but think mindset is our self-identity, how we actually view ourselves. Do I identify as a happy, a healthy person who enjoys exercise, who enjoys eating well, who you know tries to get enough sleep and takes good care of my body and this vessel that I'm in? It goes into as well with mindset, our self-talk. Are we curious, kind, honest, resilient, positive, um, determined, solution-oriented, or do we get frustrated? Do we beat ourselves up? Does the inner bully take over? And then environment is this really important secret layer. It's the glue that holds it all together. So if I can, if you'll humor me, Wes, can no, I No, I'm just, you- I'm like, I have all these questions in my head, not questions in my hands, but like comments to make, because I think that, you yeah, know, no, my, jump in, jump it in. starts like mindset is just amazing because that's where it starts at. First, you have to have the will, the desire, and you have to be in the right frame of mind, but your environment sometimes affects your mindset because you oh, yeah. think about like all the, the things that like magazines aren't a big thing anymore, but like you open up a magazine and you see an ad or you see an ad for anything and it's yep. some, you know. From the male side, it's some attracted lady who's like eating chips, but she's like, you know, 90 pounds and looks great. <laughs> and this is just, it's ridiculous that that's the thing that's set forth is when our, when what's, our what's country, the- when the people that we are around, it's not a real, it's a, it's like, that's the 0.003% of the population. But yeah. you think that visually you don't understand that, but I don't know how to, telepath, to you know, they're telepathically telling you like, this is. The type of people who eat our product or they do the things right. that we do. And then it turns you into yeah. this person who your environment sets your mind that way. And then you think that, you know, you look at like I, I look at my weight and think, well, I, I feel like I'm healthy, but I don't like the way that I look because I don't look like that. And I should yeah. have six pack abs. And like these are all things that can just completely, like you said, from the top down, yeah. generate yeah. what's going on with that iceberg. It's crazy. Yeah. And I like to walk around with binoculars. And for me, I actually teach my clients to look at their environment from like a three-pronged approach. So we have our physical environment. That's the physical space that we spend our time in. What is our fridge, our freezer, our pantry set up? Are the healthy choices the easy choice? Is our work environment set up so that we can stop and have proper snacks and meals? Do we have exercise equipment nearby or is it easy to get to the gym? If we think about the physical environment, are we driving by 10 fast food joints anywhere we need to get to in our day. And there's these little pulls to, you know, go go a different way than our good intentions. Yeah. Then the second prong, as you were getting at, is our social environment. It's the people that we're around. It's Is it the invitations to go out to drinks and food? Or is it the invitation to go for a hike in the woods when we get together with our friends? What are the magazines and the, you know, the messages that we're seeing on billboards and the checkout aisle? Then we also have now this huge environment, which is our online environment. So what are we seeing on our social media feeds? What are we seeing on where we're surfing? And there are so many invisible ropes trying to pull us one way or the other. So there's a lot to dive into just in the environment layer alone. Yeah. And it's amazing because it's all about, here's the thing that it really like to me, like it all drives back to comparison because all we do is compare ourselves to other people. And I, I'm, I'm a huge, I struggle with this 
really badly, but needing to learn how to compare myself to myself, like this is it, that is the, that is the matter, but we've been so, um, I'm I'm losing words, right? Yeah. Conditioned. There we go. Perfect. We've been conditioned to look at what is this and what is that? That's perfect. Thanks for finding that for me. (laughs) I have all these words and I'm like, where are my words right now? (laughs) But yeah, no, I agree. Like it's, you are, you conditioned to think that this is what this is supposed to be. This is how it is. And this is the only way it's going to be. And then you set yourself up for failure because you have the knowledge, you choose not to use it. You have the willpower. You can't keep going at that rate. And then all these outside factors. And then, and then it, it, like you said, it's okay. So I ate healthy today. I ate healthy today. I ate healthy today. And then like, man, I feel like I ate some ice cream. Now I ate some ice cream. Now I'm going to eat everything else because you know what? I've blown it Yeah. instead of just having the ice cream and being okay with it. Yeah. So I hope this will be helpful to your listeners. And I'm going to use you as my my demo guy if I can, yeah. because this is my my analogy or my glue that really holds the iceberg together. And I use it as a sticky metaphor. I almost always introduce this at the very start of a, a new client um, package because I've run into people on the street eight years later and they're like, Jen, I still think about the toothbrush. So if I can, you're yeah. going to be my little guinea pig and I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. All right. So did you brush your teeth last night? No. Okay, that's okay. Uh, I did. You did it. No big deal. Tell me how you're going to handle not brushing your teeth last night. Appreciate the honesty. Uh, I brush. I, this is this is bad. Now you're going to learn some real good stuff. I brush my teeth once a day, and it's in yeah, the morning. That's okay. And okay. I luckily have very good teeth. Okay. Did you brush your teeth this morning? Yes. Okay. So what a perfect example of if you brush your teeth once a day, no big deal. Sometimes people brush them twice, sometimes more. So has there been, I'm going to use your cadence, morning teeth brushing. I'm going to raise my hand. Has there been a time in the last 365 days where you just needed to get out the door and you miss brushing your teeth for whatever reason? Are you human? Has that happened? It has happened. Me too. Now, if say tomorrow morning you get up and you don't brush your teeth, Walk me through what you would then do the following day. How would you problem solve that? I would I would just, I would do it. I'd give myself more time yep, and just make just it happen. Yep. Exactly. Notice, I want to point out what you wouldn't do because it's important to note what you would do as important to note as what you wouldn't do. You wouldn't go, ah, oh, I blew it. Well, I guess brushing my teeth is off the table for the rest of the week. And if I'm going to be bad, I'm going to be really bad. Let's get my teeth all fuzzy with sugar. But Monday, Monday's the day I'm going to get myself back on track. Have you ever mentally had that mindset response to a missed rep on brushing your teeth? No. (laughs) No. I want to give you another example. Have you ever called your dentist in a panic on a morning that you didn't brush your teeth, demanding that you get squeezed in for an emergency teeth cleaning? So a super overreaction to not brushing your teeth. Have you ever done that? Nope. (laughs) Nope. So notice that you have neither of these crazy overreactions of, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I have to be extremely perfect or, well, forget about it. I blew it. There's no point even trying. It's a lost cause. Notice instead how your mindset comes right into your, your support. It goes, no big deal. And then the next soonest opportunity, you get the next rep on the scoreboard. And that's a big component of consistency is that not overreacting to an extreme perfect response or a throw in the towel. But there's one thing you might not have thought about, and that is the secret layer of your environment. So I'm going to wager a million dollar bet. If I were a toothbrush robber, which would be a very weird career, but imagine (laughs) I was coming in to steal your toothbrush. I would bet $1 million that if I beeline to your master bathroom, I'm going to find it either on the counter in some kind of cup holder thing or it's in a medicine cabinet in right beside the sink. Yep. Do I win my million dollars? Yep. Yeah. So notice that your environment has made the healthy choice the easy choice. Your bathroom is set up with your toothbrush and toothpaste right there. Where imagine if your kid went in every night like Elf on the Shelf and every day your toothbrush got hidden somewhere new in your house. So one day it's in the freezer, the next day it's in your gym shoe. The next day it's in the glove box of your vehicle. The next day it got stuck in a box in the attic. Do you think you would brush your teeth every morning if you had to go on this like wild goose hunt trying to find your toothbrush? Probably not because I mean, 
you're just going to give up after a while. You're going to give up. So what happens is people think that they need to eat healthy because they have a lot of willpower and they need to learn about the right strategy of healthy eating. But if we use our toothbrush as our champion, notice that it is a really good habit, especially because it's broken down to five minutes or faster. You have a really supportive environment that makes that decision really easy to do. And then your mindset is just really supportive. It doesn't freak out. It doesn't throw in the towel and say, oh, I blew it. It doesn't try to be perfect and like overcompensate. You just stay really consistent with the reps and notice how quick you are to forgive yourself. Like there's no long day long you know, contemplation over, am I a good person? Your self-worth isn't tied into it. The consistency is there without the drama. And so that's what we're actually looking for with healthy eating is the consistency needs to be there without the drama. And to support that consistency, we just need a supportive, you know, resilient, solution-oriented mindset. We need to set ourselves up for success by building positive environments and supports in place. And then we need to break down the good steps we want from us into these five minute or faster actions, because a lot of health comes down to five minute decisions, five minute actions. Now, some are a bit longer, but the wins for most people start to snowball when they shrink the size of the stair and they build themselves a staircase where every step they're going to be able to reach the next step. When people make steps, giant, huge, big, altering things that they have to ask of themselves and their families, oftentimes that step doesn't get taken. So just like a staircase, right? Architects have to meet code and build a stair to a certain height so most people can get up it without tripping. I sort of see the architect of healthy eating of shrink the step, build yourself a staircase where each next action step is within reach. And if you just keep walking up your staircase, you're going to move along that healthy continuum towards the better, healthier version of you. So it's a silly metaphor, but it's very sticky. People are like, I get it now. Okay, that's how I'm going to be a healthier person, not these extreme go all in. Here's the knowledge. Here's the perfect plan. Have willpower. Try and do it. That's why most people fail when they they approach healthy eating. That's so crazy. Like I never would have. I, that is like like you said. That is the perfect analogy. Like it. It's yeah. it's pretty mind blowing to think about that because um, you wouldn't. There's just something that you wouldn't skip, but. If you think about it, you know, 42 years, that's a habit that's, I'm 42. So that's a habit that was set up for me when I was very young that my mom said, you got to do this and then you do it. Um, Yeah. Have you ever just taken a break on vacation and you're like, I'm on vacation. I'm not going to brush my teeth this week. No, uh, no, because it's, yeah, no. (laughs) If, if you brush your teeth every day, at least once a day, like I do (laughs) at least once a day, Uh, your teeth get gross, you know? I mean, it's, it's, you can, you wake up in the morning and it's like, no, (laughs) like I drink coffee in the morning. And after I brush my teeth, I'm like, do I really want another cup of coffee? Because I just brush that off of my teeth, you know? Yeah. And what you're, you're getting is that feedback loop. And so what I like to remind a lot of clients is find the win first that will make you feel better before you're looking for an outcome win, which is like weight loss or change on a scale. So what I get my clients to focus on in the beginning is actually how they feel, tuning into their energy level, tuning into how their body feels after a meal. And what's interesting is as you eat more whole foods, you're really going to like how your body feels. It's going to be more energetic. You're not going to have a big slump in the middle of your day. It's going to be easier to exercise or go out for a walk. and You're not going to feel tired or sleepy or bogged down. And so what's interesting is when people put their focus on the final, final outcome that they want, which is maybe their weight or their size or their clothing or whatever, they don't get rewarded nearly as quickly. But you know, if you waited for their, your reward with our teeth, for example, to be like clean bill of health at the dentist, no cavities, that's very long off before you get that reward of, okay, right. my good habit of brushing my teeth is working for me. But if you focus on the immediate reward of, oh, I like how my mouth feels, this feels good. Mm -hmm. So you can get the immediate, I feel good reward from healthy eating. And if you tune, what you focus on expands, right? So if we wait for weight loss for us to feel good or whatever the case might be, you're going to have a lot of micro frustrations because the scale may not always reward you day to day in the moment you want because water and glycogen and sodium and like our weight fluctuates where I love this analogy, but we're bags of meat that expand and contract. So (laughs) that gets reflected on the scale. Yeah, But you can always get that energy and that feeling reward meal by meal, snack by snack, glass of water by glass of water, bedtime by bedtime, workout by workout. 
And so you can get this dopamine ding of like the feedback loop of this feels good, do more of it. And so I, I often have to have my clients change their focus because a lot of them come in frustrated because their focus has been on weight loss for so long. But when we focus on feeling, they come back the first month and they're like, this was awesome. I yeah. feel great. And then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to do more of those behaviors. Yeah. And I think that it's it's amazing. I want to ask you a little bit about like how, so obviously you use a hydrostatic weighting, but that's not the, you're figuring out with that, that gives you some results that you can do a tangible thing. But then again, like we really? talked about the prescription, how do you go through what else do you do so that you can tailor something to someone? Because that's really what it is, right? Each person is right. different. They walk in there, they yep. do the hydrostatic weighting or the um, bod pod. You find out what their body fat is and it's going to be a different, it's going to be some a different prescription for each and every individual, right? Because like we talked Absolutely. about, a person who's 50% body fat versus a person who's 38% body fat or lower or whatever higher, it's going to be different for everyone. So where do you go from yeah. there? So I left my one prop upstairs, but I can I can hold up a blank one and just sort of show you how I do this with a real client. And what we do is we call this a healthy you scoreboard. So we have this healthy habit that we go through with new clients, kicks off right away with that iceberg of success. But at the back of each person's healthy habit book, what we do is we have a completely empty calendar where we're going to focus on very specific actions. So not outcomes like weigh this or be here. It's what stair do I want to climb this month? So we might have a focus for a month on trying to get veggies twice a day. If we're a little bit more advanced, it might be about the size of our hand or 50% of the plate is veggies. But simplicity is key to success. As a coach, the best coaches can simplify overwhelm and information for their clients. So if I was working with a real client, here's a more printed version. It might be that their job is to try to have veggies twice a day and all they have to do, I have little broccolis up on the screen, two, two spots, is they would hang this up and they would just take a Sharpie or a pen and like, yep, I had veggies at lunch. Yep, I had veggies at dinner. Or it might be like, yep, I had veggies in a snack. Yes, I had veggies in a meal. And again, we're going for 80% consistency. Can you hit the step 80% of the time? Mm -hmm. You know, another week, they might have a focus. I have little sheep on here where we might focus on their bedtime. Now, can they fully control how well they sleep or how many hours? No, that's an indirect measure. But putting themselves on a wind down routine at night and a bedtime schedule, can you hit your bedtime of 10, 15 every night? Lights out. Yes, that's in my control. So each client, this is a more um, structured one where it's like a series of actions that we're going through with vegetables and sleep and protein three times a day and then a week with enough water, alcohol free, you know, no sugary drinks. Uh, we have a mindset week and then a homemade meal per night week. That one's a little bit more tailored where I have this like online program. But when I'm coaching one on one, it really is as simple as this blank calendar. We pick one, two, no more than three behaviors at once. But normally one to two is the sweet spot. And then what I do is I call it Egyptian hieroglyphic. We just make up a funny little symbol that just has to make sense for the clients and I. And we just put reps on their board. And the goal is to fill up, I think of it like a piggy bank with money. Every time they take that healthy action step, that staircase, they get to put a rep on their scoreboard. So if today I was working on maybe vegetables three times in my eating schedule, and maybe my goal, my other goal was my bedtime, say 10 o'clock lights out, I might have just like a check, check, check for veggies, veggies, veggies. And then I might just put a little letter B for bedtime. Mm -hmm. And you know, then at the end of the month, what I'm looking at is all of a sudden just like a glass piggy jar that you can see how many deposits of quarters or nickels or whatever you put in there. Like excited little kids are like, Jen and Jen, like, look, like, look at all the times. I call it voting for yourself. Look at all the times I voted for healthy me. And so you'll notice something interesting I'm omitting. I am not directing focus on the fads, the wrist slaps. We're not scolding the times they had cookies, the times they ate out, the times they drank alcohol. Instead, we want to have our direction and our focus on the next step up the staircase because what you focus on, more energy flows into. And I think that's another interesting fact about diet culture is diet culture is all about focusing on bad and taking it away. And if you want, I can get into a, a USA versus Iceland example 
of drugs and the psychology of when you focus on the wrong thing, it expands. So if we want, we can like totally. Yeah, well, out I'm on just, the I'm like, oh. I'm, it's, it's just making sense though. It, it is like, I just, I, my, my brain is just like going in so many different directions. It's, it's amazing oh, to think it. about it that way because I don't think that a lot of people, I think of like your scorecard as like a golf swing. Like you're, you're, pick, yeah. you're picking very specific things. So right. eye on the ball, right. Would be an easy one. But how many people, yes. like when I was just golfing last week and I'm like, I'm not going to tell myself too many things because I'm going to confuse myself and there's going to be totally. 90 different things. And, and swinging a long handed implement as they call a golf club, um, is very hard to do. And people mm-hmm. don't understand that because it's a big extension right. of your body. And so you could turn your hands out, turn your hands in, have grip the yep. club wrong. Like you could start counting yep. down all these Flex different things feet. that you're doing wrong. And then sure. your swing is wrong because <laughs> it's exactly. now I got to correct all these things in one shot and it doesn't really work. So you're starting small. It's almost like you're finding that little landmark out in front of you to get to first. Like if yep. you're running a mile, it's like the first, Hey, I got to make it a foot before I can make it. I got to make it one step before I can make it a, a full mile. So you got concentrate it right on that. And- and this idea of like what you focus on expands is so important. So I'm going to nerd out here in academia, Jen. This is my professor, university, foods and nutrition professor <laughs> thing coming out. But I find the psychology of behavior change fascinating. Truly, I've almost dedicated my career both as a dietitian working one-on-one and now as an educator of coaches to really bring best practices forward because there's a lot of good intention coaching that does harm more than good. Right. So I want to make it based on evidence. And one of the most fascinating things that just like blew my socks off was a drug culture issue of how Iceland dealt with it versus the United States. So drugs are a problem all over the world. Right. Um, we're not going to get into like drug policy or anything like that. I'm not an expert to speak on that. But I found the societal behavior change very interesting to study. And so what the United States did is they increased messaging around drugs are bad. Don't do drugs. You might even remember some of the ads say no to drugs. And so all of a sudden, drug use went up more and more. It's like, don't think of a purple polar bear. What just popped into your head? A purple polar bear. Or you see all these messages like drugs are bad and you're, you're a teenager and you're like, I'm not being offered drugs at parties. Like, am I not cool? Am I not going to the right place? Right. So Iceland, very interestingly, had a similar problem. They had Europe's highest kind of teen drinking drug um, debauchery rate, if you will. And so they hired a team of of social psychologists and experts. And they're like, we really want to help our teens, you know, grow into healthy adults without, you know, jail sentences and, you know, developmental problems. What should we do? Should we, you know, we just don't know what best practices are. So the solution in Iceland was to shift the focus away from the bad and more towards what they wanted their teens to do. So they increased after-school programs and they created clubs and sports teams so that if you had a hobby or interest, you could find a like-minded community to get involved. Right. If you were an art student or drama or basketball or gymnastics or you know chess clubs, like there was a place for you to go to find a group of friends. They did parenting lessons and communication lessons so parents could you know um, discipline properly, talk with their child, stay really checked in as their child was in that angsty teenager phase. Right. and maintain a strong bond and relationship. And so what's interesting is they did almost no messaging around drink less, don't do drugs, all of this is bad. They increased all of the exposure and messaging of positive actions that they wanted their teens to take. And it's a very small country. Think of the athletic prowess of our Icelandic you know, athletes. Like They're winning CrossFit games. They did super well in soccer. They have a very small group of people to pull from, but it's because Culturally, they just made physical activity and, you know, being a very engaged, connected citizen, the norm. Right. And so I found that such an interesting example on a population level that when you focus on bad, accidentally, there's a lot more of that behavior. Think of the messaging and even connected to obesity. Don't drink. Don't do this. Don't eat this. The carbs are bad. Da, da, da. We're at our highest weight crisis ever. So maybe that's not actually working. And instead, and again, shame and judgment, as we talked about, don't help people change their habits. So what if every time we did a positive thing, we got a little hit of dopamine, we felt proud of ourselves, we can see the reward of the reps growing in our health piggy bank, yeah. and we're not shaming and scolding ourselves for the misses, like forgetting to brush our teeth. We're just, oh, well, no big deal. 
get to the next positive rep on the staircase. Right. And that's how I coach my clients. And now I've created a certification to coach coaches how to be more effective if they are in the field of nutrition coaching. Yeah. It's been cool. It's, been a, it's neat to have this ripple effect. It's been really, really fun. I love it. I think that that I think, you know, I mean, that's with anything in life. Like a lot of people don't realize they they do. I, I do it myself. Like you, you put this weight on the negative things in life. Like it's a it's a yeah. heavy weight. Like, I mean, yeah, you spend you spend you mean well, like you mean well, that's the right. downside of it. It's, there's no negative intent behind it, but there's often a negative outcome. Right. And that's the thing. Like I, I sometimes feel that way about work or I feel that way about, you know, what's going on at home or whatever. Like you can just like, this person did this to me and blah, blah. And like, what, how do you really feel about that? How do you really think about that? Yeah. And that's one of the things that Mark was saying to me, you know, about like how you yeah. feel when you do something wrong or when you're in that argument or when you're in that situation. What? If you really think about what it does to you, is it really worth it? And do you feel better if you think about the other end of that? Yeah. I'll give a very funny Canadian analogy, and it's something we're like taught when you go through driver's ed and you're 16 years old, but you learn what to do if you hit black ice. So we have very snowy winters up here, or at least where I am, maybe the stereotype, and it is common to hit a patch of ice on the road and the car will start to skid. Well, what do you do? You look where you want to go. If you stare at the telephone pole, your car is going to get crunched into that telephone pole. But if I focus on trying to keep the car between the lines, and I just look down the road and I look at, you know, this is where I want the control of the car to continue to keep slipping towards. Often you will stay on the road, not in the ditch. You won't flip the car. You won't crash into the pole, but you have to look where you want to go. Yeah. And you just, you actually have to do like winter safety driving training to like pass drivers that up here. And part of it is showing that you can do a controlled, controlled skid or controlled slide. Yeah. And I mean, that's what stunt racers are doing, right? Is they look where they want to go doing those like crazy high tech or crazy high tricks. Yep. So in, in nutrition, in fitness, let's look at the reps that we are doing successfully and look at the reps we want to continue to hit on our staircase. We don't want to stare at the losses. And Mark, ta Mark England from Enlifted taught me this. He talked about the definition of a winner versus a loser. A winner stares at the wins. A loser stares at the losses. Yeah. Like think about that for a second. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a it's a totally different thing though than what we're taught. And that's that's right. the hard part. It's like you're in, I think I talked to Mark about this, but someone once told me like, how easy is it to make a pickle? Like this is the weirdest thing like ever if you really think about it. Like how easy is it to make a pickle? Take the pickle, you yeah. put it in a jar, you put it in a can, you put vinegar in there or whatever, you close it up, it becomes a pickle, right? A cucumber. Yeah. Yeah. How hard is it to unpickle that pickle? Oh, that is a good point. Yeah. A you really make it a cucumber again. Yeah. 20, <laughs> a 20 year old kid told me that one time and I'm just sitting there going, dude, that's pretty, well, no. that's pretty interesting because it's not that but, easy to undo it. So you have to undo all these things. You have to unravel yeah. all those processes to make it right back to what it was before. If it can even be done. They say it could be, but I yeah. don't believe it. I, <laughs> that's gotta be a tough thing. <laughs> I think a superpower in this day and age is actually the ability to think critically and unlearn and then relearn new information. Yeah. I think our best leaders, our best thinkers, you know, we all came programmed with societal messages, messages in our home, messages from our friends, you know, messages in the magazine racks as we're checking out online yeah. now. And I think that the, the leaders of this world are the ones who are really just looking at it as like, is this serving me? Is this helpful? And then no judgment if it's not. My other favorite metaphor is just like we have a bunch of tools. Sometimes a tool that worked in our 20s or 30s might need to just be put down and maybe we have to pick up a different tool. And I hope my role as a coach or my role as a dietitian is I now think of myself as a super general contractor. Like I had my favorite tool when I started. I was very, you know, stereotypical. Here's your meal plan. Here's your macros. Right. Here's your number. I'm the expert. Let me tell you what to eat. And that only worked for a period of time until it actually stopped working and it wasn't the best way to coach. And so I went back to school and I got my master's and I wanted to upgrade my skills. So I studied the psychology of behavior change in people with prediabetes and I was looking at a chronic disease progression and what could we do if we caught prediabetes early and could that be reversed? And I was testing out the didactic way of like provide education, provide meal plans, provide diabetes almost like fear-based education. That was the gold standard at the right. time. And then what my research study looked at is we looked at, can we do more habit-based education and give them the skill set 
of those good actions we want them to do more of. We did cooking classes, we did walking groups, we did mindset coaching. We just focused on those positive reps and those like little baby actions on the scoreboard. It was really what my yeah. master's was about. That group blew the education based fear group out of the water, not shockingly. And so it became a matter in my own practice of unlearning a lot of what I was taught in dietitian right. school and then applying more of this behavior change psychology, things like motivational interviewing, having the client be the expert in their own life. And I'm there as the road trip buddy. I'm there as the sidekick holding the map and helping them, but they're in the driver's seat. And when they get to pick their own actions, their own goals, their own next steps, there's so much more power in that than me assigning how I want them to eat. Because like you said, it's about finding your right way. And someone has to be ready, willing, able. Right. You know, we can't overload them with too many things at once. So I think that's been the greatest discovery or gift in my coaching career so far was this unlearning of what I was taught at school, which is I'm the expert and I'm going to assign like actually the food guy. I, right. I couldn't coach any more opposite of that at this yeah. time. And then it's been really cool to help other coaches unlearn some of that didactic education and the shame-based diet culture stuff that they meant well, but they didn't they didn't realize the harm it was causing. Right. And to see their businesses blow up because they're coaching in a better way. Yeah. So be like Iceland. <laughs> yes. Well, it's a it's a great conversation. I appreciate you coming on. If someone wanted to get a hold of you and talk to you or be coached by you or any of that stuff, how do they find you? Well, the best place is to just drop on our website. There is so many free um, resources for coaches there. And that is prospernutritioncoaching.com. If anyone here enjoyed our fun little metaphors and analogies game, I built out a free metaphors course. So I just love creating these sticky stories for coaches. And it's just me going through a little mini masterclass with you. And that's right there on our prospernutritioncoaching.com uh, website but help yourself to the masterclass. It's totally free. And then we open our certification three times a year. So September is our next launch that's coming up, January and May. And then that's where we actually work one-on-one -on -one with our coaches and they get direct mentoring with myself and my dietitians on our team, plus all the video training of this kind of unlearning and relearning better coaching. Yeah. So that's probably the best way. You want to just send me an email. I write back. I chat with people all the time. So I'm at info at prospermc.com. So that's NC is short for nutrition coaching. So yeah, info at prospermc.com. You can follow along on Instagram, prosper underscore NC. So any of those ways, you'll find your way back. And we can put those in the show notes if that's yeah, helpful. Yeah, for sure. Yep, definitely. I've got all the information here. We'll get it in there. I really appreciate you coming oh, so on. I mean, I feel kind of, it's one of those things where I get to talk about something that I know a little bit about and I feel kind of nerdy when I do it, but I love the <laughs> metaphors. I love all the information that you've given. And I hope that, you know, if anyone is struggling with the way that they diet, they start to think about it in a different way. And I encourage them to reach out. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, I hope this was helpful. And what a fun conversation. And yeah. I love when I get to nerd out with other nerds. It's just, it's, it's a ton of fun. Yep. Well, we'll <laughs> definitely have to do it again sometime. <laughs> love it. All right. Well, thanks again. Bye, guys. All right, everyone. Well, that is the end of the show. I wanted to say thank you again to Jennifer for hanging out with us. That is a really good near and dear thing to me. Um, as you know, I was you know, a PE teacher and I have struggled with my weight and my diet my whole life. And it's very important to think about it in a way that's healthy. And um, the toothbrush analogy was the coolest thing I'd ever heard because I'd never really thought about it that way. But you develop these habits and you have to sometimes undo some of those bad habits. So work on that. And reach out to Jennifer if you need anything. You can check it out in the show notes. Again, if you want to join the Patreon for as little as $4 a month, you can help support the show and upgrade it. Thank you to Nikki Pavlovich, who is currently our Patreon supporter. We've only been doing it for a short time, so we've got one in there, and we'd love to have you. Until next time, I challenge you to find the shape of your success.